we do have quite a few topics to go through today. In particular, we'll talk about the recent collapse of Terra, Three Arrows Capital, Celsius, Voyager. What happened to all these quote-unquote big institutions that were deemed as strongholds? And then after that, they end up dying like flies. So before we start our session, we would like to just inform the public that uh, whatever we say today, Cody, me, Fast, or any speaker who comes up later, is more like friendly advice. Uh. It's uh, not financial <laughs> advice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just con- consider it more entertainment than, uh, than, than financial advice, if anything. Lah, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so allow me to just uh, do a very brief introduction on Fast, and then I'm sure Fast later you can uh, go ahead and do a more proper introduction for yourself. So from what I know, Fast is the CEO of MX Global. It is a crypto exchange in Malaysia that has a standing partnership with Binance. Woo! So yeah. first, let's start, let's start by talking about you and your company first. Later, we will transition to Cody. Don't mm-hmm. worry about you, Cody. I'll show you no, more no, attention no. later. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I have no interest in my own introduction. I just want to ask Fuzz a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so cool. Fuzz, what else are you currently working on? And uh, how did you manage to you know, secure a partnership with Binance? Okay, so um, yeah, so as, uh, uh, as the futurist, right? So I guess we're going by our Twitter names. Oh, no, 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 no. So, you, you can call me <laughs> Shinji is fine. <laughs> Fully doxed already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, um, so as you rightly pointed out, we are the most recent um, uh, licensee, if you will. So technically, uh, so people, are, a lot of people get confused between is it a license or not in Malaysia, right? Because there's no ACTA or ACT around this, there are still guidelines, right? Which is a good thing because then they can still be kind of uh, nimble enough to account for a very shifting market in cryptocurrencies. Uh, it is a guideline right now, so technically it's not a license, it's a registration. But it essentially, for the users, it's the same experience. Like you, uh, we're, we're regulated, some other um, platforms are not. But essentially, it means that we can provide the service legally in Malaysia. And what we provide is essentially what the crypto scene would refer to as a sex or centralized exchange. Uh, in the Malaysian regulation, it's called a digital asset exchange, right? So it's a bit more a wide scope um, uh, terminology. So uh, we received uh, the the go ahead to be able to provide this service uh, uh, just about a year ago, and we really spent the first six months trying to figure out, you know, like what are the right partnerships that would make it um, uh, meaningful for us, and so that we're not just trying to replicate one of the other three DEXs. How do we differentiate is one thing, but really, how do we uh, uh, what, what kind of partners do we bring in so that we can bring in a lot of innovation? And of course, innovation takes time, but essentially, uh, what kind of partners do we want to bring in to, to bring in innovation into the, the Malaysian space, right? And we're mindful of the fact that the SE wants to bring a very um, uh, uh, well-ordered and, and, and safe environment for predominantly retail investors. So, you know, we, we started looking at, like, you know, who are the big boys in this space? And obviously, Binance came to mind. Uh, a few other uh, major players came to mind. And we simply reached out, right? And that's one of the best things about working with a part, a part of Binance. They, they're, quite, they're quite laid back and approachable in that sense, right? Obviously, we, we, we pitched to them really the angle of what value we'd be able to bring to them and what value we're expecting them to bring to us. Uh, but essentially, it was a conversation around them having very robust products that they've tried and, uh, tried and tested in many, many markets. Uh, and of course, uh, as many of you who are listening would know, you know that a, a lot of Malaysians use uh, the services of Binance, right? So uh, it's really our partnership is in the spirit of like looking at what kind of products have global demand and have maybe demonstrated that there's some Malaysian use cases or, or Malaysian user demand and trying to figure out how to work those into the regulator scene and localize them so that they are safe for investors. So it is really more a marathon rather than a sprint, as you would expect. An unregulated space is very much unbridled. And they can innovate as much as, and, and as fast as they want. And the more regulated space, yes, it's a, it's a bit of a slower pace. But we're confident that the, the, our long-term ambitions are very much aligned. So, you know, we, we had the pleasure of CZ coming down um, to KL a couple of weeks ago, uh, sorry, a couple of months ago, and we hosted some of our, invest, uh, some of our investors, i.e. our users on, on the platform, also some, some corporate leaders. And of course, we were mindful to include the regulators, right? Because I think we're all in this together. We're all learning as we go. So um, he shared quite a lot of insights and... And, you know, one of the things that really resonated well with us is the fact that, yes, Binance wants, Binance wants to be a global company by working very much with local players. And uh, we're, we're committed to growing the Malaysian ecosystem um, in, in a very thoughtful, fruitful and, and, and practical way. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, at the same time, we, we, we believe that we'll have a clear advantage because um, 
who, who doesn't know Binance and, and who hasn't tried out at least a, a couple of the functions on Binance. And we'll have those insights, right, through this partnership. So that's really what we're about. Our partnership with Binance is really a, a, a symbiotic relationship where we're, we're able to learn from their previous experience. But at the same time, uh, we're really in the driving seat, right, to make sure that however we bring those products to you, uh, it's going to essentially be safe uh, for yourselves as retail investors and maybe even later for corporate investors. Uh, and that's really that's really it, right? And I think that's a great segue into what we're talking about today, which is that some of these guys, some of these guys who have operated in the broader crypto space, have may not have uh, have operated in ways that are entirely protective of the investors' interests. Exactly. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of points right there. It's uh, guys, this is the example CEO right here, right, Cody? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, I mean, yes, yes. He's he's the example CEO. I mean, I am definitely not a great spokesperson for my own company. Um, <laughs> definitely not. Uh, uh, that's that's that's. But, uh, uh, Fats, I have a question. I have a real quick question. Um, so, uh, how many percent of your uh, uh, customer base on MX Global is institutional? Right, right now, it's zero. Right. Ooh. So right now, we're one hundred percent individual uh, investors. Uh, we are going through the motions right now with the regulator to be able to onboard uh, institutional or corporate uh, accounts. Uh, we, you, you know, we take a long view at this, right? Like we don't want to just say, hey, can we have corporate accounts? And then they say, yeah, but here's a whole list of, uh, of, of, of rules and compliance that you've got to go by, restrictive criteria. Uh, we, we talked to quite a few potential institutional investors and we understand deeper some of their needs. Uh, and, and it's very different from what you may see uh, retail investors need. So we're working, we're working through those motions with the SC. So hopefully, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give too much away, but we'll we'll be making an announcement, uh, in, you know, very in the very near future, uh, where we'll be able to welcome some uh, institutional investors. All right, all right, fast. So, so just two two quick questions from me before we dive into the main topic of tonight's session. Uh, from what I heard you said just now is that uh, I think you've met CZ in person before, so. That's one of our questions. Have you met CZ in person before? Have you talked to him uh, in person? Because that would be an extreme honor to do so, especially as a Malaysian itself. And uh, the second question is, Securities Commission Malaysia is extremely strict with regulations, right? You take a look at Binance right now. It's uh, quote-unquote banned in Malaysia, but uh, Malaysians are not banned from using it. Still, a lot of Malaysians are mm -hmm. currently using the exchange. So doesn't that uh, regulatory scrutiny affect the your exchange here since you are now having a standing partnership with Binance. Yeah, does working with the SC suck? Oh yes, that's that's a very simple question asked by Cody. Oh. Yeah, dude, that's, <laughs> that's essentially the summary. Does working with the SC suck? Tell me. Okay, me. so so let, let, let me answer the the, the 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 earlier part of of the question, which is a bit simpler, right? Yes, uh, uh obviously I have met uh, CZ in person, uh, myself and actually a couple of hundred people met him while while he was in KL. Uh, he, he's a great guy, right? And like the, the thing is, crypto is a very fast moving space. And maybe the CZ that we met in 2022 may not uh, be exactly like how he was in 2017, 2018, because the space is also different. But uh, rest assured, like, you know, not just CZ, but Binance overall has this wider view that the whole market has to go into a more uh, kind of kind of a structured and, and yes, uh, regulated kind of uh, uh, environment, right? So uh, with that being said, uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't suck working with SE at all. Uh, of course, I think sometimes as retail investors, you may want the, you know to be able to do a hundred different things because you see that being um, available in in maybe the unregulated space. And yes, uh, you could argue that the SE is a bit more of a conservative regulator, but it's uh, for, you know from my point of view, it's better to have a conservative regulator who is not closed off uh, and at least open to hearing out the cases. Uh, which is what we have in the SC, rather than a regulator who's kind of already made up their mind and doesn't want to change anything, right? Um, so the cost to all of that is really time. And so, um, no, um, the, the, the SC is not uh, averse to hearing out some of our rationale and, and, and how we want to bring some of these products to market. It's just something that takes time. Um, and yes, some people can argue that in the time that it takes to do that, we, we miss out on huge opportunities of, uh, of what's happening in markets. But as I'm sure we'll talk about tonight, some of those things when you, you don't really think through it and it's, it's hard because this is a very open space, uh, you expose you know, uh, parties that could have been saved to, to unmanaged risk. So 
we take a long term view at this, and um, and and like I said, so does the SC, uh, and so do our par- our partners at Binance. So um, it, it's you know I I'm not gonna lie and say it's an ideal case. I I think everything can move faster, of course, but everything is moving. So uh, in in that sense, uh, it is quite a good partnership that we have between ourselves, Binance, and 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 the SC. Coming back to Cody's point just now, yeah, Binance.com is banned in Malaysia. Uh, uh, I don't want to oversimplify it, but yes, simply for the the, the fact is that they uh, were pro- the that they were marketing and providing a, a digital asset exchange service without a license in Malaysia, and uh, essentially that's what it comes down to, right? So um, I guess we're lucky that uh, Binance didn't apply for the license themselves, uh, you know, and I use the term license quite um, quite uh, loosely, um, but you know, uh, the, the way that it's played out works to our benefit. And I think uh, because we've aligned our, our goals with Binance, I think it will work out to, to both of our parties' benefits, um, you know, if we're able to realize uh, most of the things that we're working on. Mm, yeah. Okay. Th- th- thank you so much, Fast, for talking about the regulations over there. So at the end of the day, to just summarize and hack what you just said, uh, the, the, the Malaysian authorities or the SE is not, they don't hate crypto. <laughs> Okay, from, 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 from what I know, they don't hate crypto. It's just that they are a bit more slower when it comes to regulations. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it's totally understandable, right? If you take a look at uh, Luno right now and a few other regulated exchanges in Malaysia, just imagine if the SE was more, I would say, faster or more quote-unquote innovative, then we could have UST you know, being listed on exchanges like that. And at the end of the day, investors being affected, they're all losing their life savings, so on and so forth, which drives us into our main topic of tonight's session. Yeah, I want to discuss about the uh, recent catastrophes we are seeing in the market. Well, we'll begin no. with the origin. Uh. Yeah, Cody? No, no, I mean, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we got UST, a, you know what I mean? Yeah, we, 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 we got to face the music here. I'm sure most of us know by now, for those of you who don't know in the audience, Luna, the old Terra, that spiraled to pretty much zero in the span of less than three days. Its previous all-time high was $120. And this pretty much destroyed the savings and investments of many people and even drove some people to suicide. It's a really sad case. Huh? And uh, I just want to open up this session very broadly, uh, fast. Why did this happen, huh? And at the end of the day, what can we learn from this? Not as investors, but you know, as a CEO of, ex- of exchange, how do you look at this? You know, are you afraid that that whenever you bring a new coin, whenever you introduce a new coin into exchange, are you afraid that you know something similar will happen also? Okay, so um, the short answer to that is yes, of course, right? Uh, any kind of token or or, uh, or coin that we introduce to the market always has risk. First of all, I think we should take a step back and, and realize that like no, no matter which one we're talking about, whether it's Luna, Terra, you know, anything in the Cosmos ecosystem, or even something built on Ethereum, uh, building a tech product is just generally difficult, right? And, and, and there are many factors at play here. So uh, I know tonight we're going to zoom in to like specifically the Luna uh, uh, USD case, uh, but we should never discount the fact that like, you know, building these tech products and with global distribution is already quite a huge challenge. There are some good products projects that fail because of the challenges that they, that they face and not because there are necessarily bad actors in the market. Now, having said that, okay, like, what, what, is, what is Luna and what, what is UST? I, I, I hope a lot of them who are, who are listening tonight have, you know, I think you have some background uh, understanding and nuance of what really kind of happened uh, over the last couple of months, right? But as, as you already pointed out, it basically, it was a stable coin that went to zero in really like, you know, three, three four days. Now, what's a stable coin? Stable coins are really uh, cryptocurrencies, which in theory are not supposed to fluctuate too much. Obviously, there's some arbitrage opportunities, but, uh, but in terms of basis points and everything, it's, it's fairly small compared to more speculative assets, uh, you know, like, like your, your Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? And there are really a couple of types of stable coins. Number one uh, would be like your asset-backed stable coins. Uh, or collateralized ones like like I'm sure a lot of people uh, listening are familiar with Tether and they have uh, the USDT. And essentially, in theory, it means that there is a bunch of US dollars parked in a bank account. And then from that balance, they mint or, or they issue out these stable coins. And in theory, that those stable coins are always going to be as good as the amount of US dollars in, in the account. Now, as some of you may be familiar, 
there's a lot of speculation there that that there's not exactly that same amount of US dollar in the account backing tether. So that's a separate issue, right? But USD wasn't that. USD is what was called an alg algorithmic stablecoin. And before really kind of this UST crash took center stage, we should bear in mind that a lot of people in the crypto community were saying that this is like the second coming of the Messiah, right? Like an algo stable, algorithmic stablecoin is way better than an asset backed one. It's, it's, it's so much amazing tech behind it. But essentially what it means is that you have a basket of cryptocurrencies. You have an algorithm that then links that to the proposed stablecoin and balancing the, the supply and demand of both sides of this equation will result in the stablecoin holding a peg against the, in this case, the arbitrary US dollar value. And, um, and, and that's what everyone thought it should do, which is true. And it did do that. However, it was also, sub, it, it, it's, it opened itself up to other factors that you, uh, and other risks, which essentially what was happening was that a lot of guys with a lot of money in a very coordinated and concerted way uh, were basically breaking the algorithm, the, the relationship between the underlying uh, Luna uh, to basically then depeg the USD from one dollar. And then, so so what's supposed to happen when the USD drops below a dollar, right? Is that uh, some other people are then going to uh, burn their Luna and then uh, get uh, a dollar's worth of uh, of USD and so be able to arbitrage that back up to a dollar. But that didn't happen. So what what instead happened was the direct opposite. And uh, because the pressure of pushing it down the peg uh, or away from the peg was, was, so, was so strong, eventually it created a ripple effect where it continued to spiral down. And essentially then it lost its peg and it went to a dollar. Uh, not only did it wreck the UST uh, token, it also wrecked the, the, the counter token to the in the algorithm uh, relationship, right, which was uh, which was the Luna itself, so um, it it's definitely not something that would have happened organically in the market. It most of the evidence points to the fact that it was very much a very well funded and very well coordinated or concerted um, action by at least a few players in the market. Yeah, essentially, in a, in a simplified sense, it's just a death spiral, like, you know. Just retail, you, you initiate enough retail panic and the rest of the work will be done by the community, right? The community will just flee from UST and then they start to mint more Luna. And then since Luna, like you explained just now, perfectly, Luna is used to maintain the pack of UST. It just goes into like a death spiral over here. I've also... Uh, pin this up on the space, if you guys can look at the figure right here, how does the death spiral work to really understand how is uh, a stable coin like this can, can collapse so quickly, especially the uh, token which is used to uh, preserve UST's value, Luna, right? It's just surprising like, for, for, for it to just uh, collapse in so so quickly. And um, let's let's face it, like, fast. The CEO of Terra, you know, Do Kwon, he was really cocky, to say the least. For those of you guys in the audience who do not know, he was calling people poor on Twitter. He was calling people foolish, stay poor, your size is not size, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the justification is that one could say that he is extremely passionate about his project. So at the end of the day, can this be considered a red flag or not? You know, because there, there were people like talking about the downfall of Luna and what could have been done better. Let's not go into the specifics, uh, but a CEO talking about their project all the time, tweeting, is that supposed to happen or, 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 or what? Fast, what do you think? Well, in my opinion, you definitely, you know, if, if, if you're building a project in the crypto space, right, you definitely have to be cognizant of the fact that a lot of guys in the crypto space live on the Twitter sphere, so Twitter is definitely, uh, you know, one of the most, if not, uh, if not, uh, the foremost platform to kind of engage with the with, with the audience or community. So, you you you, you yeah, but by and large, you do expect the founders to engage the community via an open platform in something like Twitter, and and of course, you know, the, the, by virtue of the you know how how. Um, Jack Dorsey or even um, Jack Dorsey as the founder of Twitter, he's quite pro crypto and also like you have, you know, personalities like like Elon Musk and all that also being very vocal on Twitter. I think it naturally gravit the, the lot of conversations gravitate to, to Twitter. So 
uh, number one, you do expect that the founders will be visible and engaging on something like Twitter, right? Uh, whether Dokon was cocky and all that, I mean, uh, it, it depends, right? It depends how you read it. But yeah, I, I think the, the, the chatter on Twitter is this, that he was a bit too overconfident in himself and all the project. Uh, and maybe that didn't help things. But I mean, what, what, what's the hypothesis there? Because Dokon was cocky. So then there's a, there's a bunch of guys who then said, hey, let's put together a whole bunch of money and, and rack his USD. I'm not sure that that would have been like the, the leading motivation, right? Um, this, I, you know, it, it would, it, it, in, in my opinion, it would have been a lot more around economics and being able to make money uh, on, a, a, as it went down rather than more of like kind of like, you know, uh, teaching Dokon a lesson. That having said that, you know, Doquan has tried to, uh, I guess, relaunch. You can say, right, the the Luna ecosystem with 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 uh, Luna Two, um, and, and 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 I think if he's still committed to growing the Luna ecosystem overall, um, I do believe he is committed. But whether he want to report a fiasco like a algorithmic stablecoin, I I think maybe the the pain that the market has felt and and maybe heard of from each other is a bit. Number one, like too fresh, and and number one, like uh, and number two, like you know, a lot of people lost a lot of serious money in this, right? And th there are reports that some people even you know committed suicide, and now regulators are looking into it. South South Korea is taking it very seriously, so I think the days of an algo algo coin, I wouldn't say are done, but in the near future, it's going to be very difficult to to get um, support from the market because of sentiments around the crash. Now, having said that. I know that USDT doesn't have the best relationship with the US, right? And, and, and if you look at Tether Foundation, they really op operated like a, a very, you know, like we don't work with the government, we don't work with regulators, we work everything outside the ambit. You could do something with the US dollar, you could do something like that in the US dollar because it is already in the, in the traditional world, a reserve currency for a lot of businesses and a lot of countries itself. Um, but personally, I think that, that that may not be the only way to get it done, right? As you know, like kind of like, Global economics. There's a lot of, uh, um, not a lot, but like a few superpowers who are trying to vie for that position, and China is definitely, you know, super serious about this, right? Like, how would the yuan uh, work and interplay with the fact that China has built all of this kind of like global uh, global coverage of uh, of um, of the one belt one road lo logistics, and and you know basically how they build this economic engine that connects the world. And, and it's quite admirable because it started as the world's factory, right? And now they're kind of like the world's distribution center. And then who doesn't know that of the Alibabas of the world and everything? So for me, I, I think there may be a huge potential in an asset-backed stable coin, right? Kind of like how Tether is with the US dollar, but working in a slightly different way with maybe the, the Chinese Yuan, you know? Uh, because... The, because China is so motivated to be an economically dominant force, uh, and and if if you're following kind of like their national policies, the Chinese and the US uh, or the Americans have very different approaches to cryptocurrencies and blockchain, right? So China's kind of closed it off from uh, from their borders, um, but it'd be interesting to see whether um, somebody doing a project around a, a Chinese yuan stable coin would they do it the same way as how the Tata Foundation did uh, USDT, uh, or is there a different way of doing this because um, you know Chinese yuan may be used in a different way? And personally, I think like generally, like stable coins. I know a lot of people right now are using it to kind of like um, you know stabilize their portfolio or, or use it as like kind of conduit in between trades on exchanges. But there's surely the market is moving towards a, a point where your cryptocurrencies are not just used to be trade to be traded. But you might want to use it for really real world purposes, right? And uh, from what I know, like the Chinese are very much utilitarian, uh, utilitarian in kind of their use cases more than the speculative ones of, of like kind of American type products. So I actually f find that quite fascinating and, and kind of like, I guess this Eastern philosophy of a stable coin may be very different from a, a Western philosophy of a, of a stable coin. So long story short, I don't think there's much space for an algo coin in the near future, but other types of asset-backed stable coins uh, may, may be quite a serious uh, use case that's going to be in this next wave of, of, of evolution. And, and, and the reason I say that is because we're, we're, we're clearly in the winter, right? 
and a lot of these amazing new uh, products are built during these winters and we'll, we'll see what comes out of that yeah amazing fast thank you thank you for your thoughts right there uh, Cody yes. go ahead Cody please okay all right that was that was a lot all right that was I, I need to I need to co- cohesively piece together my thoughts okay um I think Do Kwan's craziness um is in my opinion uh it's okay um I think I think many um many great innovators have a little bit of crazy in them uh simply because they're just different human beings right and 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 I'm kind of okay with a 29 year old 40 billion dollar worth man um acting out a little bit on Twitter um I think that that's 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 um that's permissible. That's like it, it discounts for a lot of things. And and in my opinion, the Luna ecosystem was by far the best ecosystem that I used in my whole crypto career. Uh, the Chinese have already implemented the uh, e yuan, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and uh, it's it's kind of like a CBDC. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I hate it. I, I don't think I don't think it's a choice. Uh, because for 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 international people like us, for foreigner pe- for foreigners like us, we have a choice not to use the yuan. But for people in China, I don't think there is a choice for them not to use the yuan because it's a legal tender. It's enforced it, uh, within the country itself already. So, uh, w- w- what do you think about this? First, do you think a CBDC will will work in the the, the crypto industry? Because the governments are actually trying to push this. Uh, let let us just diverge away from the current topic and. What do you think, Fas? Yeah, so I think in, in some jurisdictions, uh, it's more a matter of when rather than, uh, than if a CBDC would exist in that jurisdiction, right? Um, the motivation may be different country to country, you know? Uh, for example, like, just to simplify it, like, America probably doesn't want to lose its position as, like, a global reserve currency. Um, like, like I shared before, the Chinese are very much motivated to see how they can take over that kind of position uh, from American dollar. Um, you, you can't call a, a case of something like El Salvador and say, hey, you know, El Salvador went full on Bitcoin. And so that's how every country should, should, should look at um, as a utopian kind of uh, end result because actually El Salvador didn't even have their own currency before that, right? They were just using somebody else's currency. So uh, there could be a case to be made that where, well, what's the difference for, an, for El Salvador to change from US dollar to Bitcoin, right? Uh, maybe even it's, it's better because they're, they're not subject to the policies of basically the, the, the Federal Reserve uh, in, in the US, maybe. Um, do I think that CBDCs are good or bad? I, well, I, number one, like, let's just point out that like, you know, that there's this premise that all of these things built in cryptocurrencies are you know, all because of decentralization and decentralization is going to release us from the, you know, the... The, the the underhanded grip of governments, yes. right? That they the control power our lives. Of centralized power. Okay. So. Yeah. So so I and I get that, right? And I get it, and I and I get how that's also very a very strong narrative, especially when you know you move towards this Gen Z generation where this kid in Nambia is is looking at the Hollywood lifestyle of somebody in in LA, right? And then like kind of like your 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 appreciation of what life should be and could be is very much warped, right? Because if you if you rewind this back like fifty hundred years. You know, if you live in in, uh, in 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 Malaysia, you may not expect your life to work out like an American. You may not even know how Americans live. You know, um, so I get that. Now, when when you leave it entirely up to the industry without rules to do it, it could work if no if there were no bad actors. But as recent events have shown, not only are there bad actors, but there are bad actors that can coordinate, right? And in some cases, they may coordinate faster, better than, uh, than, than the retail market can catch up or catch on to. So, yeah, may, maybe, maybe the, that, that utopian future of a totally decentralized world was legit in the beginning, right? But as we see more and more evidence of um, users abusing other users, and, and of course, not every user comes into crypto with the same bag of money. Some of them come with a lot more uh, disposable uh, income or, or, or dry powder. Um, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't entirely call uh, you know call call um, you know uh, discount the role of more centralized or you know this the, the the previous establishment players right. Now coming back to the China case, I don't think it's really a question of whether the Chinese uh, citizens have a choice or not to use the digital yuan. 
China, like like many cu- countries, have a restricted currency. Our Malaysian ringgit is also a uh, restricted currency. That's why in Malaysia, you can't just go around and buy something with a Chinese one and US dollar. You're going to use ringgit for everything. Um, but at the end of the day, like what what is really the legal tender, right? It's just it's just going to be a conduit for you to be able to transact. And if anybody's been to China in the last, uh, you know, five years, you'll see that like most people don't carry cash. So living with, you know, what we as Malaysians may, may, may understand better as like e-money, it's kind of na- second nature in China now, right? So I, I, I don't speak on behalf of the Chinese government. I, um, and, and, you know, kind of like my interaction to China has just really been more on like a, a, a business and like a, as a tourist kind of experience. Um, it kind of works, right? You don't have to carry all of this cash around and, and you can go to a QR code that the, the lady at the stall accepts it. Uh, the, your, your Alipay, you go to an, another store, you, you can pay with WeChat Pay. So, uh, they've, I, I would say like quite admirably, like China has been a country that has been able to go into digital adoption of quote-unquote money much faster than any other country. So, if I were a betting man and I had to bet which country could transition that into a blockchain base or blockchain-related or powered version of their money monetary system, it's probably going to be China first. So, yeah, um, I, I think the, the, the jury is still out on whether the, the digital yuan is truly a blockchain or not. I, I, there's, there's a lot of uh, criticisms around whether it's a true blockchain. But nonetheless, it is at the very least a digital ledger, right, which is hosting the, uh, the movement of, of, uh, of, of funds and, and money. So, um, I, I, I don't really think a lot of Chinese people are complaining about using a digital version of money. Now, there is a different argument for like surveillance, right? Uh, so, so then that's a slightly different angle. Maybe if you come from, you know, uh, libertarian America, where like, you're like, you know, privacy is my own thing. You shouldn't be able to know when I sit on the toilet or whatever and all that. That's one part. But again, the way that the Chinese government has kind of like nurtured their citizens are slightly different, right? And you can, you can see that clearly in, in, in terms of how China reacted to the COVID pandemic versus, you know, uh, America that didn't want the government to tell them what's good for them uh, while, while this pandemic was like kind of sweeping across the world. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it's, it's fair to say which approach is right or wrong. They're just different approaches. Uh, but what can be done with blockchain in, in either one of these approach would, 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 would definitely be different. And it'd be interesting to see, right, how they do it. Yeah, it's it actually, yeah. Cody, Cody, please go ahead. Yeah, there's nothing I have to add. I just wanted to say, um, I'm happy to be here. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. glad to have you here all the time, Cody. Really glad to have you. Yeah, uh, fast. Thank you so much for the points you mentioned just now. And uh, I think on 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 the part where you mentioned the uh, digital yuan not really being a blockchain, right? Uh, it, it is a blockchain la, with just one node. La. <laughs> uh, just, just one node run, running the whole thing. It's kind of like the Federal Reserve, right? <laughs> so, so uh, and, and, and your point about decentralization is extremely interesting also because uh, everybody hopes to, 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 that, that the system itself is decentralized. You're not supposed to know where I'm going. You're not supposed to know where I'm sitting on the toilet. But this type of future is probably veering towards a more you know, if, if, if I were to permit it, a more dystopian side, because it's impossible for the uh, government to grant entire freedom to its citizens, especially if you're looking at China. And at the end of the day, the Chinese people are used to it, right? So my, my point being is that if it works, then why, why, why disrupt it, right? So yeah, I, I'll not dive the, into the rabbit hole on this one, but uh, allow me to stay on, allow us to stay on topic here. And yeah, that, maybe can, can I just make a quick comment on that, right? Hey, please, 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 go ahead. Decentralized does not mean total anonymity, right? Yeah. yeah. Decentralization and privacy are two maybe related, but they're, they're not the same thing. Decentralized would mean that the information cannot be manipulated easily by just one actor. I mean, that's why we always talk about this 51% uh, 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 risk, right, on, on networks. It means that the data which is on the network is true because everyone agrees that when new data comes in, that data is true. It doesn't mean that nobody should know who you are at any time. In fact, most of us here probably use a centralized service. So at least those centralized service providers, like MS Global, for example, we know who you are and what you're doing on our exchange, right? Um, it's, it doesn't, decentralized doesn't mean that you can never be surveilled because there's also a price to be, 
to pay if you cannot surveil anything, right? Because then you cannot protect the guys who cannot protect themselves. But at the same time, if you look at blockchain, right? There is... So, so, so just to put it quite, quite simply, like when they build the internet, there's two missing layers. Number one is an identity layer and the other one is a financial layer. Over, over the last couple of decades, the financial layer of the internet has been built and basically hacked together, right? You have PayPal, you have the different SWIFT banking system, you have how they all talk to each other, but it's not a native layer of the internet. And the internet also didn't have a native layer of identity. Like, you know, your, your own Gmail account is not your identity. Anybody could have bought that username if they were able to do it before you, right? But in blockchain, there is a premise that you can create an identity layer on the network where the control of the identity remains always with the user, uh, no matter how and where he's using or inter uh, interacting with the network. And I find that this will be the most interesting part, right? Because if you give users all control of their identity and how their identity can be uh, integrated, consumed, or interact with, with systems, then you give them ultimate power, but not ultimate uh, anonymity, uh, anonymity, right? Which is quite important. Users should be able to indicate to systems who they are to be able to give the other side of the transaction uh, assurance that they're, they're, you know, that I mean, you don't want to be dealing with an ISIS terrorist on the other side uh, of a trade, right? Um, I don't know, maybe some people do, but I think the vast majority of people don't want. But uh, allowing either, part, uh, either party in that trade to be able to identify themselves at, at their own will and then con uh, conducting a trade, I think it's quite essential. Because in the, re in the traditional or real world, how do we do that? You fill up a whole bunch of documents or like you, you live in a country where the government basically underwrites the risk of who you are. The government says, yes, this guy is fast and if you deal with him, he is a, a, a real person, right? Uh, in the decentralized world, if, if, if you allow users to do that, then... It doesn't matter about governments anymore. Like users can control their own identity, and then other users can interact with them with assurance. Uh, maybe that's that, that might be a, a topic we can dive into at a different session. I, I find it quite interesting. But no, yeah, this, it's, it's this definitely... identity layer is is, is going to be a huge dif you know dif difference maker in, in in the blockchain future, right? I hundred percent agree, uh, and I think there are already uh, third party uh, uh, services that that provide such uh, data banks that that also. Uh, work together with governments. Um, IPS is one of them. Um, uh, over here, like uh, as a protocol, I think one of the main uh, legal issues is 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 the KYC issue because you cannot buy property, um, no matter at what fraction, um, without the government understanding uh, who is buying it. Um, and of course, <clears throat> all of that is very important. Um, but however, uh, I would like to be a devil's advocate against my own business. Ah, I'm, just, I'm I'm so stupid. But but wouldn't this space wouldn't the luxury of it be that you have the option to not KYC? Because there are plenty of services that, 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 that offer you the services at whatever risk that may hold um, with no KYC, like Bybit, for example. Like, wouldn't that be the number one yeah. use case of this space? Yeah, I, 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 don't think, I don't think it discounts uh, or, or disallows that use case at all, right? Um, some some platforms may, may opt to allow users to still participate without KYC. Or, or without electing their uh, uh, their identity to the rest of the users, but what I'm saying is like you know you can allow market forces to take place, and there will be some set of users that only want to interact with a, a, a counterparty user that they can verify. M maybe maybe if you imagine this in an exchange kind of scenario, it's a bit a bit too academic, right? Because like maybe you don't you don't really care who you get a bitcoin from as long as it's, you get a bitcoin, and the exchange should be should have policies in place to make sure that. All actors are clean in that sense, uh, so you don't really care whether it's really fast transacting with Cody or Cody doesn't care that it's, it's really fast selling him the Bitcoin. But if you look at broader use cases of blockchain, right? Uh, if you imagine that you're Samsung and then uh, you 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 want to get a supply of uh, of LCD panels from your van, uh, from your supplier, maybe you as Samsung really care that 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 contract or that smart contract you're signing with the real vendor, right? Uh, and, and not just uh, fast disguising as a LED manufacturer from Malaysia, and then uh, you know potentially robbing you of of whatever the smart contract is tied to, right? So I, I do believe there are certain use cases, especially in real world utility, where blockchain identity can play a 
very serious role because there are transactions where both parties want to know and want to have assurance uh, apart from their, their, their own, you know, uh, uh, by, by party uh, uh, communication that they are dealing with each other. Because at some point, when these things kind of go the wrong direction, then other parties get involved, right? Like courts and all that. So you want to be able to to uh, assure that you, you knew who you, were, who you were dealing with or at least you elected to the other party your true identity in case it comes down to a situation where you need to, to have that evidence in the future. Yeah. Again, a set of very interesting thoughts right there. The blockchain, essentially, it's it's not meant to be anonymous, so to say, because it's just an open public ledger, you know. And the addresses, at the end of the day, we can just trace back to who the original users are with enough efforts from the FBI. I've heard that the FBI can also actually, based on your IP address and whatnot, be able to track you down, uh, despite a lot of people claiming that the blockchain is uh, completely anonymous and it's the best thing for criminals but actually it, 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 I, I personally think it's the dumbest event, invention for criminals because you wouldn't want your transaction stored permanently in a public immutable ledger so at the end of the day criminals will still prefer to use cash right because cash is pretty much untraceable but yeah uh, Cody, yep. let's, not, let's not forget the original use case of bitcoin <laughs> the Silk Road. Let us not forget this historical fact, okay? The oh, very yeah. purpose of cryptocurrency is to transact drugs. So that is the origin, and let us <laughs> respect its origins. But let us also understand its its, its uh, eventual evolution, which is what Fads mentioned. The eventual understanding of everybody needs to KYC eventually, right? There is this. It's just this is a more trustable world. With with a more trustable world, we get a more prosperous. Pro, 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 prosperous nation and all that um, understandably um, my thoughts yeah. are so jumbled up <laughs> I think uh-huh. I, right, you might have been uh, smoking some stuff uh, Cody <laughs> that is that is currently deniable to whatever extent that is currently credible to me uh, let us move on let's... yeah okay okay let, let's, let's move on guys right the next the next thing that I, w- I would love to talk about is uh, Celsius yeah uh, let, let's let's dive into this topic. I think a lot of people have been affected also. Uh, for those in the audience, if you are affected, you can just raise your hand up, okay? But if you're a bit shy, you don't have to react, okay? Yeah, but uh, just quick update on Celsius. It is currently filing for bankruptcy uh, after suspending withdrawals from its users for more than a month already right now. So yeah, I just I just want to direct this question to Fast. Fast, can you briefly explain uh, what Celsius is? and uh, how their business model works. Because I think a lot of people in the audience here, when, when they go to an exchange, they go like, oh, I'm just going to go go there and earn some Bitcoin and I don't care how, how they earn a Bitcoin as long as I get my 5% or 8% APY per year. So fast, please take it away. Okay, so Celsius is essentially, um, it's a yield service provider, right? And it's, it's, it's a centralized um, network. So what it did was it it hosted accounts on Celsius and these accounts bring in a variety of different cryptos and then they essentially lent it to Celsius and Celsius lent it back to other users. Now they had their own token which would um which, which is how users were allowed to kind of take loans, make payments, you know, basically all of the Celsius centric transactions. But that one lives on top of an ecosystem where you as users are essentially bringing in your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, and you're borrowing other stuff out, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, maybe I don't need to explain to like the, the different benefits of the cell token itself, but the cell token, uh, on top of doing their own uh, centralized transactions, you know, it promised users uh, like better yields, cheaper loans. Basically, you use it as an, as an incentive mechanism to make users do more of what you wanted them to do, which, was the, which is commit their funds and then uh, either the same or a different set of users borrow funds out, right? Celsius wasn't a small deal. I mean, it, it was pretty active. I think at its peak, it was it had over 840, 850,000 members. They had more than 300,000 active wallets. So you can imagine, right, that the, 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 all of this kind of added up to about 16 billion worth of what, what's typically called assets under management, right? So the dollar equivalent value um, of, of all of the, the, the crypto assets which were parked on the Celsius platform. So Celsius was giving very, very 
competitive yields. And like you rightly pointed out, most users didn't ask how are you getting this yield, right? They just kind of, it became like this magic box where you just put in, put in your money and then more money comes out. I believe at, at, at its highest point, uh, on maybe not the highest point, but like at the most persistent points where it was high yield, they were providing like uh, six, more than six, 6.2% on your Bitcoin, right? Which was, which is quite high. And as a user, you might be sitting back and you might be thinking, hey, my, I'm just parking my Bitcoin there, I'm staking it, I'm, 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 I'm earning on it, and it's just growing by 6%. Well, eventually the Fed lady sang, right? And then, and this is, this is not only related to the, to the USD crashing, but it is, it is related to the fact that there's so much leverage in the system now. Different players were borrowing money from either other people or from the traditional finance space, and then they were also borrowing money from guys like Celsius. So Celsius had, had huge exposure to some of these other players, and, and you know um, the the, the Luna Collapse is also one of them. And and when the market reacted was uh, when the market reacted was when Celsius basically posted um, you know something along the lines of like because of extreme market conditions uh, we're pausing withdrawals. And now in, in, in this last couple of weeks, right, like every time I hear uh, an, uh, a platform announce we're pausing withdrawal, everyone assumes that they're insolvent, right? That's what I was saying. I think when, when the Celsius news came out and a lot of people were, were kind of like, you know, putting out their thoughts in the Twitter sphere, like the more you pressure them when they say we're, we're pausing withdrawal and then you just accuse them of being insolvent, you don't give them much time to try to sort out what they're trying to sort out. So eventually Celsius came out and said something like, um, you know, they're taking the actions and, and dealing with their lawyers to, uh, to, to address the, the issues, but then they're also trying to take proactive measures to stabilize liquidity on their on the markets, so at least to me, it showed it it showed me that, that at least Celsius were trying to to ride the ship, right? Um, however, most recently, I think um, in fact, like a week ago, the news came out that that Celsius, with all of sixteen billion assets under management at one point, had less uh, just around like hundred and sixty seven million cash on hand to support its operations, and so it needed to move into a huge restructuring. And uh, because it re received a lot of pressure from 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 different regulators and and and, and uh, Fed, like even the um, you know kind of like subsequently what happened after the Federal Reserve in the U.S. Uh, increased the interest rates, uh, there's a lot of selling pressure in the crypto market. So um, again, not to oversimplify it, but when the underlying assets are also losing value, and then you don't have that much cash on hand, and trying to get liquidity from the assets they have on hand results in even you know relatively less cash than it would have it would have a couple of months ago it becomes kind of like this perfect storm that where it's pretty it's a it's a pretty deep hole to dig out of right so um again i i, I think we have to kind of run you know work through the motions but a lot of the signs point towards the fact that really celsius is very much insolvent now and what that means for you if you're a celsius uh or investor that had funds parked in celsius is that you may not be able to get it back. So, you know, I, I, I think that's the crux of like what we're discussing today, right? When you invest your crypto or your money or however you term your crypto, right? But some sort of store of value for yourself, uh, you may be opening yourself to risk and those platforms may not actually have to give you back money because they've covered their, they've covered their proverbial, proverbial uh, behinds legally uh, not not to say that they'll get away with it. They will have to face, uh, you know, creditors, legal action, and all that. But you may not be one of the guys that they're going to have to be. That they, they they will legally be compelled to pay, and that's just a shame, lah. Because the retail investors are basically they just become bag holders, right? And um, and I think that's what's happening a lot in the market now. So I guess you can extrapolate from that, right? Eight hundred something thousand members, three hundred thousand active wallets. Not everyone's a whale there. So there's a few hundred thousand people that have, that have lost. I hope they haven't lost their life savings, but they've definitely lost a significant portion of their portfolio. Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at Reddit itself, right, on, on Celsius Reddit, a lot of people are actually sharing their own experiences on how they were struck by double catastrophes. First, they put half of their life, saving, life savings in Terra. Then they thought Celsius was a safe place. And now Celsius blew up also. So, you know, essentially, it, it really just 
exacerbated the entire problem, uh, you know. And and the, the part where you talked about uh, the yield itself, right, I just want to just reiterate uh, what you just mentioned just now. What Celsius does is basically they are a lending or borrowing platform, sort of a bit like a bank, okay. Um, they take users' funds and after that, they loan out your funds. Basically, your hard-earned money, they will loan it out for an additional interest so they pocket some of that interest. So this is how they earn money. And they say majority of the interest goes to the lender. And at the end of the day, you do not know who Celsius lends to. They might have lent to uh, Three Arrows Capital. They might have lent to a lot of other DGEN firms out there because institutional clients, they love to borrow money. It's not just uh, retailers who are full DGENs. Huh? Let me tell you this. I think Fast can agree with me. So uh, big corporations and institutions, hedge funds firms, they are pretty much as degen as us, if not more greedy. Okay, so the, the perfect example is Three Arrows Capital. We'll talk, we'll talk about Three Arrows Capital later. So at the end of the day, you know, when, when we we'll come back to Celsius insolvency right here, the, the way they earn high yield is basically just to use their utility token over here and, and, and drive up the price. Essentially, if I was the CEO, what I could do, now fast, I need to ask you whether this is doable or not. If I create my own token, uh, the exchange token, let's say sell token, will I then be able to secretly use customers' Bitcoin funds to buy back sell tokens and drive up sales price and then further increase the demand towards sell tokens and essentially just tell people that, hey, we are fully backed, but actually we are like a, like a bank. We are doing fractional reserve banking. We are lending out way more than what we have in the bank. It's, it's possible, right, Fast, that they're doing this all behind the scenes. I, I mean, it's not possible in the Malaysian regulation. La. <laughs> but, but yes, from a technical perspective, if you ran a platform like this, which, which like you rightly pointed out, they kind of behaved like a bank. Uh, but because the regulations are not as mature in traditional banking, if they did do that, number one, is it ten technically fe uh, possible to do it? Yes. Uh, number two, would they get away with doing it? Well, I guess now that there's a crash, people we're going to start peeling peeling back the layers and, and, and finding out whether they, they did some semblance of that. But um, in a lot of the decentralized space, people get away with doing a lot of things because there is no golden standard that they have to adhere to, right? As much as traditional banking or traditional finance has its flaws, uh, the majority of the what could have been abused had been addressed. But, but bear in mind, like traditional finance had like so many years to get to this state, right? Whereas crypto is not only is it very new, but it's also very fast moving. So fairly difficult for regulators to think through and work through the data to be able to, and the exposure can be global, you know, as opposed to like you open a bank in Wyoming, for example, or, you know, even if you open it in Singapore 40, 50 years ago, uh, you, you, you can't serve the world straight away, right? So slightly different scenarios. Um, I, I hope some of these platforms didn't do that, but my gut tells me that the temptation would have been there and then the, the, pos the possibility of being able to get away with it was fairly high, uh, at, at least you know, a, a couple of years ago, that, um, that yeah, they, they would have basically propped up their own books internally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's entirely possible. Uh, you know. So the, 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 the funds are really with Sifu right now. Uh, Fast, what do you think? Funds really with Sifu. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think everyone should try to be your own Sifu. And, and the yeah. reality is like to try to be your own Sifu, you, you have to do some of the boring stuff yourself. Like, you know? and, and that's something that I've been telling a lot of people. Like, read the terms and conditions. You know? and, and that's because I work with, with, I mean, not just MS Global, but some of these other projects I work with. Yeah, it's very dry to go through the, T's, the TNCs. But I, I understand from the business perspective, when the lawyers draft it, they have to protect the business because uh, you don't want to in introduce more undue risk or at least risk that you can't already mitigate. But uh, th the converse of that is that as users, the terms and conditions typically tell you uh, how big the risks are for you. So if you look at an example of like of, of Celsius, right, they actually have in, the, in their T TNCs, you know, uh, a specific line that says in the event that Celsius becomes bankrupt, enters liquidity, and, and this is important because Celsius has announced that it's, it's filing for bankruptcy, right? It actually says that if Celsius becomes bankrupt, enters liquidation, and is unable to, uh, or in, in, in some circumstances, unable to replace obligations, any eligible digital assets, which essentially is money that you have loaned, 
right, or deposited into Celsius, in the earned service or, or, or used as collateral in any borrow service may not be recoverable. They actually tell you that up front. So when you say it's not like, you know, when, when, when USD crashed and people said, oh, USD is so risky, my money is so safe in Celsius. No, Celsius told you it may not be safe if these things happen, right? So um, am I saying that, that? So so number one, Celsius was not disingenuous in terms of what they were trying to do. They ran a business model that is very, that is very risky and not just because of their own actions, but also because of like kind of like the market conditions surrounding them. Uh, it ultimately led to the scenario where they're bankrupt. But the most important thing, because I get so many so many friends now telling me, how can they just take my money like that, right? They never pay me back. Well, actually, they, tell, they told you already up front, if we can't pay you back, we're not going to pay you back. Or we're not going to be obligated to pay you back, you know? Yeah, I, th- I think this is a very interesting uh, topic to talk about. So allow, allow me to just stay a, a while more on this part. Uh, on the part where you mentioned just now, they are not obligated to pay you back. Allow me to just read a sentence directly from Celsius Risk Disclosure. Now, I did attach this into the session itself also. So, by engaging with Celsius, you acknowledge that there is a risk that Celsius may become unable to repay its obligations to its creditors. In which case, your funds may be lost in whole or in part. So, this this in itself is literally what you said just now, you know. Uh, at the end of the day, you, users cannot have no right to blame Celsius if, uh, they, they, if they lost their funds, right? However, my, my point right here is, I, I really need your thoughts on this. However, this big disclosure wasn't first page news, right? They, 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 they didn't include it in their website. It was extremely difficult to find this particular article, you know. It, you have to specifically Google Celsius risk disclosure PDF. And then only you will find it. If you Google Celsius terms and condition, it's not there. It's, it, you, you just read through all that stuff. Plus, within the risk disclosure itself, now this is just based on my personal experience, it's not at the first page. It's at the third page, plus it's not highlighted, it's not bolded, nothing. They expect users to find a detail like that. Well, some of the users may, but... Let's take iPhone, for example. When Most of the time when we buy iPhones or when we literally buy anything, they ask us to go to the app store and agree to the terms and conditions. Do most of us read the terms and conditions? Fair to say, I think most of us know, right? Probably one in a thousand, okay? So at the end of the day, my point here is, is it our fault for, for, for really not going through the terms and conditions in detail? Because that's, at the end of the day... It, it, it's not fair to say that it's not our business also because lawyers are supposed to read it, but we are not trained to be lawyers. So you, you, you get where I'm coming from first? I'm yeah, I, I, I get your point, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm not a lawyer, neither am I a judge. But when it comes down to the courts, like Celsius would, have, would be able to show that they made the information available. Now, was it easily available? Was it called out? Or as you said, was it bolded out? Was it there and like, you know, 30-point font for everybody to know this risk? Um, again, it has to come down to the to the laws that it's subject to. But in most laws, it doesn't spell that out. It doesn't say, you must assess which ones are the biggest risks. You must make sure your users acknowledge this explicitly, right? That's why, like you said, when we buy iPhones or we use other software or whatever, a lot of these things are actually touched into what we typically call the fine print. It's actually there. So at the end of the day, it's not like the cost will blame the users, but the, most likely the position will be that um, Celsius did make this information available and users could have been informed of it. It doesn't mean that users had to, like Celsius was compelled to make sure that every single user read that line. You just had, it, it would be a different situation if, if Celsius never declared this in the terms of conditions or even risk policy and everything, right? Uh, but that's not the case. In, in, in most of the cases, these fairly well-funded and, and organized um, uh, platforms they do make these disclosures available. So, for example, like even if you want MS Global, it is very, it is fairly clear from our terms and conditions that we hold your funds in custody, right? Uh, which is very different than how you do it for um, for Celsius. So, because we are regulated under the Malaysian jurisdiction, when you deposit your digital asset, your your Bitcoin, or even if you deposit, you know, your your Malaysian ringgit, it doesn't mix with our operational accounts. It cannot mix with our operational accounts. The only way that some of those go into our operational accounts is that when you do a trade and we charge you a, a taker fee, that fee becomes our revenue and then that portion becomes 
you know, part of our operational uh, balance. Other than that, it always remains in trust and we cannot do anything with your funds. This is at least, I mean, because of the situation we're in now, this is at least one of the strongest arguments for why you should use a regulated service versus an unregulated one. Maybe if I put it quite simply, right, if you're too lazy to read the terms and conditions, just use the legal players, lah, you know, because somebody else has had to read through our terms and conditions and before we could have put them out and made sure that we, you know, were, were, were fairly disciplined and have to follow that. So this is the downside of, of decentralization, right? If you want all the power to yourself, then all of the accountability has to be on yourself. If you don't feel that you're ready for that, then you probably want to rely on a third party. Um, so maybe in the case, in, in the example I highlighted, maybe a regulator to make sure that that service is safe. And, and that's kind of gives you a bit more color to in, like, you know, the challenges of, of running a regulated business, right? We can't just tell you how and what and when we want to tell you. We have to tell somebody bigger first, the regulator, and then they say, okay, now you, you can provide the service to customers. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Fast, for clearing up the, the mess over here. A, a, a lot of things to unpack from what you just said. And, and essentially, uh, terms and conditions, they are vital for customers to read it, you know, because at the end of the day, we are paying our own uh, hard-earned money. So what's the hassle in spending about 10 to 15 minutes to read the terms and conditions, right? And at the end of the day, if, if we are still uh, refusing or perhaps lazy to read the terms and conditions, then just look at the regulated players over here, right? And another thing which I really like to mention is we've always heard before low risk, low reward high risk, high reward, right? But in the crypto space, high yield is extremely high risk, okay? So uh, for those of you guys who do not know, if, if, if a platform grants you extremely high yield, then there is something funny about it already because if we go back to Binance, which is the largest crypto exchange in the world right now, okay, just an example, uh, their, their Bitcoin, they grant you 5% APY. That's high, but that's for the first 0 0.01 BTC only, okay? The, the, the 0.01 BTC, after that, to, to, to 0.5 BTC, the yield drops to 0.8%. So from 5%, the yield drops to 0.8%. So therefore, if you have like uh, exchanges that can loan you out 6, 7, 10% APY on your BTC, then it's a bit uh, fishy at that part. Lah. But allow me to just, you know, stay, stay back on topic. TNCs, yeah, fast, let's dive into it. What should we pay attention to? You know, when, when, when we sign up on exchange, okay, let, let, let me just shoot a few examples. Okay, Binance, uh, Luno, and your exchange, MS Global. What, let's say you are a new user right now, Fast. What, what will you pay attention to when you were to sign up into uh, either one of these exchanges? Okay, I mean, uh, I, I'm most familiar with the MS Global ones, right? So, um, if you if you open up MS Global and then you you scroll down our website and then you go to the terms and conditions, um, we 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 tell you in the in our disclosure we 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 also call it terms and conditions, right? So it's fairly straightforward. You should look at the points that that tell that talk about. I, I mean, this is because it's a it's a it's an exchange service, right? You want to know that in the exchange, where is your where is your money treated and what are the risks that you're uh, you're exposed to? So. Um, if you see our T's and C's, there's, there's a specific per, um, section, section 6, that where we disclose to you the risks, right? What we will be responsible for, what we will not be responsible for. So you, de de so you have to sign a self-declared risk acknowledgement to understand that when you invest, you take on the investment risk. You see, like a regulated exchange like us, we, we remove the risk of us doing something to your funds, but we do not remove the risk of you making the wrong investment call with your own funds. So that's fairly clear. And then if you look at um, the MX wallet, so in our case, and I believe the, the, the Binance case is similar, in terms of how your funds exist in the wallet, it's, it's under a, a section called the, you know, in, in our case, the MX wallet. And, and I believe in Binance, it's called the Binance wallet. So in there, it actually details to you, like, how do you, you know, how do we treat transfers in and out of your wallet? How do we treat transfers of fiat? How do we treat transfers of digital assets? So if you read through these fairly boring paragraphs, you have a fairly good idea of what happens to your funds when it enters our ecosystem and how and, and, how and when it can leave our ecosystem, right? So those, I, I wouldn't say those are, those are the only important parts, but I think maybe that's where you want to start because sometimes the, the TNC documents are fairly long, 
So you want to see, you want to understand what the platform declares upfront as a risk, and you want to see how the how the platform treats your your money or your crypto, and 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 at least in the case of an exchange, it's in the section where we that where we we disclose the wallet function itself. Right. Yeah. Thank. Thank you so much, Fast. I think after the session itself, you can uh, probably bring up the TNCs, uh, specifically the risk part. And uh, tweet it out so that I, I I can help you retweet this. And I think this is uh, vital information for uh, a lot of people to know also. At least they can see, hey, actually, this exchange specifically mentions uh, what particular risk are in, risks are involved when we sign up, uh, so on and so forth. Then we'll be able to carry uh, whatever we've learned onto other exchanges we are currently using. Because apart from uh, what I just mentioned, Binance, Luno, MX Global, there are still tons of exchanges out there, KuCoin, Huobi. And uh, I, I'm pretty much sure that majority of the audience here did not read TNCs of any exchange. So I guess the best advice right here, obviously friendly advice, uh, is to go and check your exchange that you're currently using. Go and read the TNCs and specifically the risk disclosure part, uh, guys. A, home, a little homework for you guys tonight to do. <laughs> Yeah, actually, actually maybe, maybe I can share here for the audience right? because a lot of yeah, people yeah. They have they open yeah. multiple wallets on multiple exchanges. Uh, what I find quite common, whether regulated or unregulated exchanges, is that we typically have to build out a function to suspend or terminate accounts. And and I'm not saying that that exchanges like us will terminate your account and run away with your money, but there is a common behavior where users kind of like you know diversify their holdings, right? They put it in different wallets, and sometimes you don't touch those wallets for quite a while. So, um, in some exchanges, there is like a term, like there's a, a certain amount of time after which the exchange can actually decide to make your to terminate your wallet. And so, if you have Bitcoin or crypto or, or whatever in that wallet, the exchange actually will remove it out of the, the wallets and then you need to go through a process to claim it. So, that's another risk point that I want to highlight, right? Like, if you are one of those people that have many, many wallets, and then you're kind of like, you know, trying to, you're, you're doing that because you don't want to expose the password risk of, 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 of just having a small number of wallets. Uh, but sometimes you might have left that wallet for years. Uh, you might want to recheck that because how do they define dormancy? Because in some cases, if those, those accounts are not are dormant for X amount of months, the exchange or the, the service provider can actually shut down the account. And so you may lose access to your crypto. Mm, yeah. Uh, a sobering reminder for uh, people. Be right back, guys. Hey, Cody, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If if there's anything you, no, you need I'm to say, just... I'm, I'm 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 joking. This this just, just, just <laughs> kinda... Yeah, I'm I'm definitely checking my. Cody Cody, <laughs> Cody has to log on to all of his uh to all of his DGN wallets to make sure that, <laughs> they, they they don't dormant now. Yeah, all of the uh, how many NFTs you bought using multiple wallets? How many ETH are still there? It's like, oh shit! I still need to make sure that they are not terminated. Uh. Yeah, but I, I, I would like to ask you another interesting question first. There is this very, uh, I would say, hot debate going on. Okay, We all know that cold wallets are the safest because we store our seed phrases personally and uh, it's our own custody. Like, at the end of the day, you know, if you want to debate about cold wallets having risk, we can still dive into that. But I want to stick to hot wallets, in particular MetaMask, Trust Wallet, and compare it to centralized exchanges like uh, Luno, MX Global, Binance. Now, there is a debate on both sides saying that, you know, oh, centralized exchanges have more risk, you know, third party control your funds, blah, blah, blah. They can do whatever with your funds. Then Hot Wallets is like, hey, Hot Wallets also have risk, you know, if you connect to a link, then your whatever in your Hot Wallet is drained. Let's say a user, you know, refuses to buy a cold wallet because they deem cold wallet is too expensive. What would be the safest option? Will it be to store in a centralized exchange or... Uh, store it within MetaMask. Obviously, before we say anything, uh, not financial advice. So fast, please go ahead. Yeah, so not really from a financial advice perspective, right? But we just talk about it in terms of a technical perspective. Um, and maybe I can paint it with with, with an anecdote first. My, my, my first ever email account is a Hotmail. Okay? But for the life of me, I cannot remember the password now because I started using other services eventually, but I still have the Hotmail account. I, I can never open it because I don't know the password. So I think the first thing you have to consider is that how likely are you if you take on all the responsibility of your own custody that how likely are you to always have access to the password because 
you know, now the seed phrases are so that, that, that you know, it's seed phrase is there, it's secure, yes, but I doubt anybody can just, you know, off the top of their head, just regurgitate the, the 12 seed phrases of the metal bank's wallet, for example, uh, right? So I think that's the first thing you have to consider. Although in theory, a core wallet, whether it's Nano Ledger and all that, is good, but if you lose the keys to that, it's gone forever. Lah. Nobody will ever be able to figure out how to get into that. So yes, it's safest in terms of nobody can get into it. But if you are also part of the group that cannot get into it, even if, if it's yours, you're kind of just doing yourself a disservice, right? You'll, you'll, you'll lock yourself out. Um, now, it's very difficult for me to say that um, storing it on, a, on an exchange is, is very safe. Uh, because obviously I have a conflict of interest, I run a, a centralized exchange. Number one, obviously, if an exchange is regulated, the risk of the exchange doing something with your funds is lower than the unregulated ones. That, that's just a fact. Number two, doesn't mean that our business is here to stay forever, right? Just because you're a regulated business doesn't mean you cannot go bankrupt. It just means that you play by the rules. And sometimes the rules may not, uh, may not link directly to a commercially viable business. Um, so the other consideration is like, do you think the central exchange you're parking it under will be around, you know, X amount of years in the future? Because if they go bankrupt, and again, if you read the TNCs, maybe there's something that they can or cannot do with your funds if they go bankrupt. Now, in the case of MS Global, we went through not a bankruptcy, but actually we applied for the license in 2018 uh, when the regulations came out. And we were, we were unfortunately one of the ones that were not awarded the first round of of, uh, of licenses, but I think we, we were quite proud of our team because we were persistent and, and went through the entire two years of the appeal process with the SC. So at least you, you know that we're very serious about and committed to running an exchange business. Lah. Um, but I, I highlight that because when we were told to stop the service, um, we spent the next nine months ensuring that every single investor got back whatever Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or digital asset they had deposited before we were told to, to stop the service. So sometimes you want that, right? In, in, in our case, we were committed because we, did, we didn't want to have this black mark against our name as we went through the appeal process. However, in 2018, there were more than 46 exchanges operating in Malaysia. Obviously, after the guidelines, there's only three that's allowed. So you could ask yourself the question of like, hey, what happened to, you know, 46 minus 3, that's, that's 23, right? And if you minus us, then you ask, like, what happened to the other 22, right? Did they make sure that everybody else got back their funds? I, I guess it's, it's not something that we can easily answer. But there's a risk there. If they stop their business and they basically close shop, maybe you can't access the funds anymore. So I think these are two of the main considerations that you want to give if you want to either self-host your wallet versus going to a service that's going to host it for you. So... I'm not saying that everybody here should just put your money in MS Global and we can hold it for you safely, but you should understand the, the, the benefits of being regulated versus the risk of the, the commercial sustainability of the business. Um, Binance is great because they're, they're one of the biggest in the world, yes. Uh, but let's not forget Binance is also, they, I think they just turned five years old, right? You know, I think some people, maybe the OGs here, they had money in Mt. Gox. So things, risk can be exposed in so many different directions. So not a very straightforward answer, but I guess if I had to summarize it, yeah, in theory, in theory, if you had just a cold wallet, it's the safest, technically it's the safest place to, to, um, to store it, but it entirely depends on risk that you subject onto yourself. So if you're going to forget the, the seed phrase or not have a way to recover it, it may not be the best viable option. Lah. Yeah. Great, great sets of points there. Lah. Allow me to just unpack what you just said. Basically, to summarize everything, it depends on the user itself of whether they can, uh, uh, what, what depends on the user's risk appetite, right? It's whether you trust yourself or you trust a third party holding your funds. Obviously, the third party that you trust must be at least regulated in whatever country you're in, in this case, Malaysia, to ensure that the uh, third party does not at the end of the day, do anything with your funds. And if we come back to the hot wallet point, right, like Metamask and stuff, I here's my perspective. I, I'm not sure about you, Fast. I, I don't really like putting too much funds in a hot wallet like Metamask because there have been too many cases of Metamask getting hacked once they just click a link, right? You can see OpenSea, even, even some Pentas, also some people have Pentas, their, their, their hot wallet get hacked. So at the end of the day, when we come back to the safest option is, you know, 
whether you trust you holding your own keys in a code wallet or you trust a third party which is you know regulated within uh, Malaysia itself. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we are we are down to our last question for the night here. But we but before we go to our last question, just want to inform you guys uh, in the audience, it's an open session. Uh. If you guys want to come up here and uh, ask any questions, you guys can just ask away. And uh, first, we are doing a giveaway, right? First. Uh, are we? <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember the giveaway? I told oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you, you can go ahead. Like, you, 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 basically, you if you send any of us, any of the speakers, your Bitcoin, we'll send you back uh, three times the Bitcoin, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cody, you want to you wanna talk about the giveaway? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, plenty. Um, if you send me 10 Ethereum, um, I'll... I'll I'll put it in MX Global and it will multiply by three times. So far, is actually <laughs> responsible of the account. Yeah. So so this this our giveaway, guys. Later, uh, if you guys want our wallet wallet address, right? You just DM me, Cody, or Fast, right? Then we'll send you our wallet address. You send us you send us at least one Bitcoin. Immediately, me and Fast will triple your Bitcoin holding back. Right, Fast? <laughs> yeah, we send you three Bitcoins. <laughs> No, yeah. no, no. I, I, okay, I mean, obviously, for the for the audience, right? Yeah. Like, we, we just want to highlight the fact that, like, you could come to a talk like this. We could all seem fairly credible. And uh, and there will be this, like, crazy, you know, uh, too-good-to-be-true kind of offers. In most in most cases, la, they are too-good-to-be-true. Um, recently, you know, um, I, 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 I shared, I, I, I posted to, to somebody because... Well, you know, sometimes these scams are very sophisticated, right? You know, they use a, a video that was on YouTube from months ago and they host it as if it's... And, and this one was legit because I reached out to the to, to the guys who, who run this. I, I don't want to name names because I don't want people to get the wrong impression. But essentially, there was a legitimate video of a fairly uh, reputable service provider. Uh, and this other scam, these scammers, they used that. They made it look like, you know, how you attend like these online seminars, right? You know? Uh, and then in there, they were promoting this yield. And then they had bought a domain which had the services name in there, uh, .yield or .farm or something like that, right? And, and yes, people literally sent uh, cryptocurrencies because the banners were there promoting this. And then they thought that it was really promoted by the, the legitimate company because the company is in the video. So nowadays, right, you got to be very careful uh, because all the scams, they're very sophisticated, right? Uh, it's not like the, the olden days where you can see right through them. And um, like if, not, not to say I fell for it, but like I really thought sometimes when the narrative was very strong that Elon Musk really was giving double the, the Bitcoin that you would send him, you know? Um, and, and sometimes it's very difficult because it just looks like you could believe it. Um, and, and some people will then say, hey, I did get it back. And then you might be, you might be duped into it. But uh, my, my advice is like, you know, always fight that, that temptation. Like, if something's too good to be true, I mean, put it this way, right? Guys, if I knew a way to double my Bitcoin, I probably wouldn't tell anyone. i just do it myself, right? I, uh, like, Ooh, all, all, this all, is all. so right. This is so right. If you had a secret trading strategy, he, 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 you can relate this to literally everything, right? It's like, uh, a lot of people are promoting trading bots or like uh, 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 ridiculous trading strategies. If you have a particular strategy to double or triple your holdings, right, you would never tell anyone. And, and essentially, all those people that are trying to promote this are being rich off you. Right? So, so there's a lot of scams out there. Like, and the part where you mentioned the uh, YouTube video one, I've actually encountered it multiple times. And the first time when I've seen it, right, was last year. I almost fell for the scam. I almost like, well, uh, Dad, do you have like uh, 100 Solana right now that I can borrow? I want to double my Solana holdings. But fortunately, I wasn't so rash. Because what they do is these people, they actually... When, go and buy legit, legitimate YouTube advertisements and they prop up their followers. You see their accounts, they have like 100,000 followers, but all those followers are bots. They are bought. And afterwards, they just post a previous talk of a particular CEO, in this case, Elon Musk or Vitalik Buterin or something like that. And then they just say, you know, uh, uh, they just put like a tweet, a fake tweet that, oh, I'm giving out uh, 100,000 Bitcoins. You know, all you need to do is send Bitcoins to this address and after that, the, the, the algorithm will automatically send you two or three Bitcoins back. Now, there is so many of these type of scams, but at the end of the day, we must know that 
if you were to send any one bitcoins which you don't know online, chances are you won't uh, get your bitcoins back. So it's a giveaway, lah. You know, you give away your funds. You get what I mean? So it's a giveaway, but but you know, you 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 giving away your funds. So I I I wouldn't want anybody to fall for this, and uh, which is why initially, I even wanted to tweet about this. Hey, why not? Me and uh, Fast are doing a special giveaway. Cody is in it also. Send us one Bitcoin and we will triple it back. Here's our address. But we are actually afraid that people will, will do it. So <laughs> at the end of the day, we, we didn't tweet this out and uh, we don't want to get sued. La. But it uh, just goes to show how many uh, scams are out there right now. And uh, everybody should be careful. La. Apart from just uh, reading the TNCs. It's a dangerous world out there. Yeah, okay. Um. But but uh, but you know I think that's a great segue into like our last question right three ACs which is basically yeah. yes. like a bigger version of what we just shared. They went to people and said, "Hey, if you give us your Bitcoin, we'll double it because we'll invest it. We'll do amazing things with it. We'll make so much return. We'll get so filthy rich. You'll be rich also, right?" And that's really what really hap- what what happened with a with a hedge fund or or, or a crypto venture fund like like three AC. Yes, they were. Maybe now, in hindsight, we can say they were overconfident in the strategy. And yes, in the early part, maybe the strategy worked a bit. They did have uh, quite a few home runs, right? Like they had some very good investment that paid out very well. Uh, but essentially, it, you, you can have a hundred successes, but the, the, the hundred and first, which is a failure. And if that, that failure is, and my, my argument is like, because it was really over leveraged, right? Then the whole thing comes spiraling down. You lose everything. Not just you as the operator of 3AC, but even the guys that invested in you, right? They lose so much exposure. Yeah, just just to uh, recap on what 3AC is, lah, for those people who don't know in the audience. 3 Arrows Capital is uh, considered one of the top three VC firms in the world. Basically, what they do is they manage uh, clients' funds. You have to be somewhat of a very rich people or an institutional investor, lah, they call you. So, like, like what Fast said just now, lah, you give me your money, Okay, we are 3AC, we will double, triple your money in the span of a year or two. But essentially, what they do with your funds, you don't know. because, And, and that's what 3AC did, right? They, they literally went over leverage, they, they borrowed their funds, and then lend and borrow again. They do this like uh, very elaborate trick. But when the market starts to fall, it's when the secret starts to be revealed, right? And they, they weren't able to pay back their debts, they weren't able to meet their margin calls. And at the end of the day, they were liquidated by multiple exchanges. Uh, from what I know, I think BlockFi, uh, Voyager have also liquidated them for combined funds of over $1.5 billion. And uh, Fast, do you know the assets under management for 3AC? Because I, I, I don't think I can find it. It's like a, at least 5 to $10 billion, right? If not, if not way more, right? Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, there is a... A, a case ongoing now, right? So um, I think in time, maybe some of them will be revealed in the the public papers associated with 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 that um, with, with, with that uh, legal action. But uh, based on what has been publicly, I wouldn't say disclosed, but has been exposed publicly, uh, you're looking at an exposure in, uh, in around about uh, ten billion US dollars asset under management. Uh, I, I I'm not in a position to say all of that is gone. But uh, it is fairly clear that they had a substantial stake in, in Terra Luna. And so, you know, when the USD thing, at, at the top of the hour, we discussed about when USD went to zero, uh, obviously that was an investment that didn't play out uh, uh, that well on, on the books of 3AC. So this may not have been the only one that went south, but like you rightly pointed out, because the markets turned and essentially Bitcoin was worth less, Ethereum was worth less, a lot of the altcoins also are worth less. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you imagine... The assets now depreciating in price. On top of that, they had taken leverage position, which, which, which means that they had borrowed money to make certain positions. And like you pointed out, they couldn't make certain margin calls. Basically, they bet a certain way in the margin uh, and then the, the markets went another way. Um, in some cases, they were not able to top up their account to maintain their, pos- uh, their, 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 their positions. And what, what that means really, like let, let me try to explain that in like fairly layman terms, right? If you have a thousand ringgit and then you buy a thousand ringgit worth of bitcoin whether it goes up or down you'll still have uh however much bitcoin you you first traded into right uh because you don't have this exposure of the movement of bitcoin versus the ringgit yes on paper it may be worth less but you have no other risk exposures beyond that when you take a leverage position 
and then you make uh, 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 basically it's like the the decentralized version of like options and, and futures, right? You bet on a movement of something, and basically if it moves a certain direction by one unit, you had you 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 leverage that, and so that one unit worth of movement might be ten u ten units worth of of profit for you. When it moves one unit the wrong way, you then owe ten units worth um, in the in the loss. And in some cases, you may not have liquid funds or or, or liquid uh, or, or enough crypto to be able to cover the the, the ten in, in the loss position. So that's essentially what happened, right? And that's what people typically call call margin calls. So these margin calls happen very fast, and there was the volume wise for a player like Three AC. It was a huge amount. They didn't have enough to service this, and that's essentially why their their, their positions got got called. And so, um, long story short, they owe more money than they can afford right now. Yeah, they 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 have, <laughs> they they're basically in deep shit lah. Okay, to 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 say the least. And when we talk about margin calls, right? Here's the scary part, right? If for for those traders out there, I think you guys might know about this also. Setting a stop loss is part of a trade, trader's must-know strategy, right? But sometimes, in very huge market movements, I think fast you can agree with me on this, your stop loss might not be hit also, right? So, at, at some cases, where, where, when the markets move very drastically, maybe 3 arrows Capital, they had some of their you know funds where they placed a stop loss or, or whatever, it didn't hit their stop loss and at the end of the day, it, it, went, it blew through their stop loss and uh, they weren't able to recover any of their funds and hence they were liquidated also. So, I guess... When it comes to volatile markets like this, we have to be really careful with uh, the amount of leverage we use. Albeit, the best thing is not to use any leverage. Obviously, uh, not financial advice. Because like what Fast mentioned just now, well, whatever you trade, because you're borrowing it, when you want to earn 10 times more profit, it works the other way around also. It's a double-edged sword. If the market goes down, you probably have to pay 10 times more also. And if you're unable to pay that amount of funds, then buy your initial pool of funds is just gone like that. So first, it, it, it literally just goes to show that we are not the only DGENs here, right? <laughs> that, that, that's, the, that's the conclusion of tonight's session. We are not the only DGENs. Retailers are not the only DGENs. And uh, it seems like institutions are probably, they, they don't know better than us. Are, are we right to say this first? I, I wouldn't say they would they don't know better than us, right? Now, if you look at like an institutional setup, okay, so let's just say, you know, I'm an individual investor. Everything ultimately re depends on what resources I have at, uh, at my disposal, right? The amount of research I can do, um, how much of the, 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 the data I can crunch, whether I have the innate ability to build out these financial models to not to say predict, but like, you know, to make calculated decisions in terms of, you know, what, what kind of positions and what kind of investments I'm going to make. If you compare myself as an individual investor versus a team of whether it's 5, 10, 50, or 100 people, like in, in major institutions, you know, maybe this is teams of hundreds of people, uh, they, you can make an argument that they do know better because they're able to work through a lot more data and a lot more information. It doesn't mean that they're always right, but it does mean that the, the rate at which they can process information and try to come up with a strategy at the very least is faster than you can do yourself okay um so in in cases of like three arrow capital and other hedge funds they do have teams looking at this and unfortunately sometimes in hindsight it's easy for us to say oh they made the wrong call maybe at the point that they made the call they felt that it was an educated uh risk to be taking but the market went the wrong way right uh, because you cannot predict what's going to happen in the future, and ne neither can you predict what's going to happen in the next five seconds on 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 your chosen uh, exchange, whether it's decentralized or whether um, centralized or, uh, or regulated or or unregulated, right? So, I, for for me, and again, it's nothing to do with financial advice, right? Just my 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 own opinion is that it's fairly easy for the market to say, oh, these guys were like total degens, they were super irresponsible. I don't think that's true. I think to a certain degree, they did instill some discipline. But unfortunately, just because you have discipline doesn't mean everything plays out to your favor. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to point, the, you know, like, like Do Kwan or, or Shuzu and all that, like they, they're, they're good or bad guys. It's, it's, it's not a point about that, right? But it's just that investors take risks. 
and and whether you're an individual investor or institutional or, or group investors like you know uh, investing as an institution uh, you have to understand that depending on what you decide to do you either minimize or you exaggerate the risk and if you're not able to react fast enough if if your strategy depends on that then maybe don't take a strategy that you can't afford to to sustain so myself personally like obviously you know 24 7 i'm running mx global and 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 believe it or not if you're running an exchange doesn't mean you can be a great trader no we, we have to make sure that exchange works so i personally don't choose to have a high frequency trading strategy because i cannot afford the time and i think at the very the very simple fact is that that's, that's my number one advice to a lot of people right be cognizant of what you can afford to do yourself do the research there and understand the risk that you're taking and whether you can afford the risk and the resources to be able to do the strategy that you want to do. It's too easy to say, hey, my friend said that this, this meme coin went from, you know, less than one cent to like four bucks, so now I, I, I got to come in. It's too easy to say that if you don't understand the risk surrounding all of that, then sometimes you should take a step back and say, yeah, maybe I'm, I will not make money from, from the appreciation of that, but neither am I in a position to be able to take that risk blindly, right? And that's quite important because I think we always say like DYOR, right? Do your own research. The reality is doing your own research takes time, takes a lot of effort. And um, my, 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 really, my advice to a lot of people who are, who are looking at investing into crypto is like, you should put in the work to do the research because not every strategy can just be easily replicated. You can't expect tomorrow to behave like how it was yesterday. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, it's, there's so many things you can do to help yourself, but a lot, a lot of these things cost resource and time. Yeah, perfect. Perfect sets of thoughts right there. Uh, just to really summarize the entire session of uh, funds with funds are with Sifu, <laughs> uh, if, if you guys want to ensure that your crypto funds do not belong to uh, Sifu, first things first is that uh, always be, remember to do your own research. Uh, you know, spend, spend the time I, I think it's well worth it. Yeah? Do, do not rely on the YouTubers who talk about this particular coin, so on and so forth. You know, spend whatever amount of money that you spend on a particular coin, you must spend also an equal time to really understand how it works. Not trying to say that you must understand in and out the code whatsoever, but at least be able to talk about it to other people. Now, if you're able to speak freely about Bitcoin with other people, then you somewhat know the technology already and then you, you have more confidence to uh, put your money into it. Uh. And the next thing is, you know, always invest in what you can afford to lose only. To say that, you know, uh, some people are saying that I don't understand why people can lose their life savings, but at the end of the day, it's not their fault. It's just that they don't know uh, proper risk management. So do not invest your life savings or whatsoever. Just put a set amount, dollar cost average or something like that, you know. Yeah, I think we have come to the uh, end of our session already. And whatever we said today, guys, remember, it's not financial advice. If there is any questions for MX Global CEO fast after the session, do not hesitate to ask. Just DM us the questions. Or I think fast, your DMs are open, right? Will, will, will the community be able Yeah, the, the, the DMs are open. But I think like we, even though we, we can close like the formal part of the session, like, you know, we can, if anybody wants to come up, we can also like kind of take it as a, Fairly free and easy Q&A, right? Yeah, yeah. But you did mention, remember I told you, I, I, I messaged you about this. You, you wanted the requirement is uh, those people who step up must have a crypto punk as their NFT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think we can be quite flexible there, lah, right? You yeah. don't even have, need to have an NFT. Um, I, I actually, through, throughout the session, I did click on every, uh, you know a few people's prof profiles. Just throwing it out there, right? I don't know if, if, if people are aware because I'm actually also having this, not to say Twitter war, but like, I'm confronting some of these NFT max maximalists, right? Uh, a lot of NFT maximalists on Twitter, they talk a lot about NFTs, but they don't even verify the NFTs because Twitter has a way to verify your NFT. Uh, and when you do this, your profile picture comes out as a, as a hexagon as opposed to a circle. Uh, not not here, not, not if you're looking at the spaces thing now, but if you click on the person's profile, you can see it's a hexagon. So... Uh, Funny fact, the guy, that I'm, the, the guy that I'm arguing with is actually the, he claims to be the real owner of the board ape that's on my avatar now. So that's not my, my actual board ape. But I'm trying to prove to him like, my avatar's circular and so it's his. So he hasn't even been with Twitter, even though he goes around.
ownership, he doesn't actually do it for himself. So, yeah, I, I think it's not. It's not my mind of running an exchange. Though. I just want to call out people when you know they, they say one thing, but they don't they don't actually do it themselves. You know. Like I would, Cody? I would love to do it for myself. Um, it's just that Twitter Blue is not available to everyone in the world. Um, I think currently it's the same yeah, as yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, the the guy I'm arguing with is a, is American, so he, so he I know uh-huh. he, he can do it. <laughs> that hypocrite want to save three dollars a month. Oh, uh, uh, well, it's only three dollars per month, huh? It's it's uh, wow, actually it's it, it's quite affordable. But you know, when when you take a look at Malaysians, Malaysians, uh, they they're not really willing to spend like you know twelve or thirteen ringgit per month on. Uh, yeah, you know, if they are NFT fanatics, maybe, but just to verify their Twitter picture, maybe some of them are not willing to spend that money. But yeah, we'll we'll leave this discussion into another session. I think it has been a, a great session with you, Fast. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Cody. Also, great great to have you here up on the stage. Also, you know, you, you've always uh, lightened up the mood and uh, made made everything much more humorous. Uh. Yeah, any any last words from you guys? We'll start with Cody first. Any last words before we close tonight's session? Um, no last words. Um, um hello. Oh yeah, yeah um, go no ahead. last words. Uh, just 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 happy to be here. All right, Cody. Yeah, you you go ahead and be awesome, my friend. Uh, fast, fast. Last words, fast. Fast. Are you still here? Any last words from you before I uh, close the session? Yeah, really just in closing, like, you know, I, I just want to advise, I just want to just share like something advice to everyone, right? Like, crypto is relatively new and it has all sorts of risks. And and I really advise that whatever you try to engage in in, in, the, in the crypto space or the, the decentralized space, I know it sucks and it sounds very boring, but you should just try to prepare yourselves and just do that research, right? Um, and and maybe you won't make the million bucks, but there's a huge risk associated with trying to make that million bucks if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and hopefully you can make out uh, with, with with fairly good returns uh, and have that peace of mind uh, when you do kind of pursue some investments where you're a, you you have a lot more um, um, you know uh, an educated um, kind of background against what you're trying to do. So. Uh, yeah, good luck. Um, you know, enjoy the space, and 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 I'm looking forward to kind of like how it all shapes out in, in over the next couple of years. For for listening in, I hope it's been um, you know, helpful to to everybody who's listening. And you know, if anybody wants to kind of come up and share their thoughts, ask some questions openly, uh, I, I guess we're more than happy to to continue that. Yeah, if there are any questions, I think now is the best time. If you guys want to step up and and join the panelists here to. Uh, or perhaps just join, join, join in with the topic if you guys have anything else to add. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much again, Fast, for coming up for today's session and agreeing to uh, uh, talk a bit about TNCs and uh, Terra Luna Death Spiral, so on and so forth. Okay, guys, I think if there is uh, no questions for us, I wish you guys uh, good luck and uh, be sure to educate yourself when investing and stay safe out there, guys. Good night. Bye. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.